Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys, A Midsummer Ramble in the Dolomites By Amelia B. Edwards Chapter 1 Monte Generoso to Venice Part 1 an autumn in North Italy, a winter in Rome, a springtide in Sorrento, brought summer round again, the rich Italian summer, with its wealth of fruits and flowers, its intolerable heat, and its blinding brightness. The barbarian tide had long ago set northwards and overflowed into Switzerland. Even those who had lingered longest were fain at last to turn their faces towards the hills, and so it happened that the writer and a friend who had joined her of late in Naples found themselves about the middle of June, 1872, breathing the cooler airs of Monte Generoso. Here was a pleasant hotel, filled to overflowing, and numbering among its guests many Roman friends of the past season. Here, too, were green slopes and shady woods and meadows splendid with such wild flowers as none of us had ever seen elsewhere. The steaming lakes, from which we had just escaped, Como, Lugano, and Maggiore, lay in still shining sheets three thousand feet below. The vast Lombard flats on the one side shimmered all day in burning mist to the far horizon. The great snow ranges bounding Switzerland and Tyrol on the other glowed with the rose of every dawn and turned purple when the sun went down behind them in glory every evening. Having this wondrous panorama constantly before our eyes, with its changing lights and shadows, and its magical effects of cloud-wreath and shower, catching now a sudden glimpse of the Finster Airhorn and the Bernese Range, now an apparitional vision of Monte Rosa or the Matterhorn, or even, on a clear morning from the summit behind the hotel, of the far-distant Ortler Spitze on the Tyrolese border, we began somehow to think and talk less of our proposed tour in the Engadine, to look more and more longingly toward the north-east horizon, and to dream in a vague way of those mystic mountains beyond Verona, which we knew of, somewhat indefinitely, as the Dolomites. The Dolomites! It was full fifteen years since I had first seen sketches of them by a great artist not long since passed away and their strange outlines and still stranger colouring had haunted me ever since. I thought of them as every summer came round. I regretted them every autumn. I cherished dim hopes about them every spring. Sketching about Venice in a gondola a year before the time of which I write, I used to be ever looking towards the faint blue peaks beyond Murano. In short, it was an old longing, and now, high up in the mountainside, with Zermatt and the Engadine close within reach, and the multitudinous Alps extending across half the horizon, it came back upon me in such force as to make all that these great mountains and passes had to show seem tame and undesirable. Fortunately my friend, whom I will call L for briefness, had also read and dreamed of the Dolomites, and was as eager to know more of them as myself. So we soon reached that stage in the history of every expedition when vague possibilities merge into planned certainties, and the study of maps and routes becomes the absorbing occupation of every day. There were, of course, some difficulties to be overcome, not only those difficulties of accommodation and transit which make the Dolomite district less accessible than many more distant places, but special difficulties arising out of our immediate surroundings. There was S, for instance, L's maid, who, being delicate, was less able for mountain work than ourselves. And there was the supreme difficulty of the courier, a gentleman of refined and expensive tastes, who had hoard what is generally understood by roughing it, despised primitive simplicity, and exacted that his employers should strictly limit their love of picturesque to districts abundantly intersected by railways and well furnished with first-class hotels. That this illustrious man should look with favor on our new project was obviously hopeless. So we discussed it secretly with bated breath, and the proceedings at once assumed the delightful character of a conspiracy. The Reverend John R., who had been acting for some weeks as English chaplain at Stressa, was in the plot from the beginning. 
He had himself walked through part of our Dolomite route a few years before, and so gave us just that sort of practical advice which is, of all help in travelling, the most valuable. For this, for his gallant indifference to the ultimate wrath of the courier, and for the energetic way in which, with a noble disregard of appearances, for which we can never be sufficiently grateful, he made appointments with us in secluded summer houses, and attended stealthy indoor conferences at hours when the servants were supposed to be at meals. I here beg to offer him our sincere and hearty thanks. All being at last fully planned, it became necessary to announce our change of route. The great man was accordingly summoned, the rider, never famous for moral courage, ignomiously retreated, and L. the Dauntless undertook the service of danger. Of that tremendous interview no details ever transpired. Enough that L. came out from it, composed but victorious, and that the great man, greater than ever under defeat, comported himself thenceforth with such a nicely adjusted air of martyrdom and dignity as defies description. Now, there are three ways by which to enter the Dolomite district, namely by Botzen, by Bruneck, or by Venice, and it fell in better with our after-plans to begin from Venice. So on the morning of Thursday the 27th of June we bade farewell to our friends on Monte Generoso, and went down in all the freshness and beauty of the early morning. It was a day that promised well for the beginnings of such a journey. There had been a heavy thunderstorm the night before, and the last cumuli were yet rolling off in a long, billowy rack upon the very verge of land and sky. The plains of Lombardy glittered wide and far, Milan gleamed, a marble speck in the mid-distance, and farthest seen of all, a faint, pure obelisk of snow, traced as it were upon the transparent air, rose Monte Viso, a hundred and twenty miles away. But soon the rapidly descending road and thickening woods shut out the view, and in less than two hours we were down again in Mendricio, a clean little town containing an excellent hotel, where travellers bound for the mountain, and travellers coming down to the plains, are wont to rest. Here we parted from our heavy luggage, keeping only a few small bags for use during the tour. Here also we engaged a carriage to take us on to Como, where we arrived about midday, after a dull and dusty drive of some two hours more. It was our intention to push on that afternoon as far as Bellagio, and in the morning to take the early steamer to Lecco, where we hoped to catch the 925 train reaching Venice at 4.30. Tired as we now were, it was pleasant to learn that the steamer would not leave till three, and that we might put up for a couple of hours at the Hotel Volta, not only the best in Como, but one of the best in Italy. Here we rested and took luncheon, and despite the noontide blaze out of doors, contrived to get as far as that exquisite little miniature in marble, the cathedral. Lingering there till the last moment, examining the cameo-like bas-reliefs of the façade, the strange beasts of unknown date that support the holy water basins near the entrance, and the delicate Italian Gothic of the nave and aisles, we only ran back just in time to see our effects being wheeled down the pier, and to find the steamer not only crowded with passengers, but the deck piled, funnel-high, with bales of raw silk, empty baskets, and market produce of every description. End of section 1「Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys」section 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys, A Midsummer Ramble in the Dolomites by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 1. Monte Generoso to Venice. Section 2. We were the only English on board, as we had been the only English in the streets, in the hotel, and apparently in all the town of Como. Our fellow passengers were of the bourgeois class, stout matrons with fat brown hands cased in netted mittens and loaded with rings, elderly pères de famille in straw hats, black-eyed young women in gay shawls and fawn-colored kid boots, and a sprinkling of priests. It had probably been market-day in Como, for the foredeck was crowded with chattering country folk, chiefly bronzed women in wooden clogs, some few of whom wore in their plaited hair that fan-shaped headdress of silver pins, which, though chiefly characteristics of the Canton Tessin, just over the neighboring Swiss border, 
yet is worn all about the neighborhood of the lakes. So the boat steamed out of the little port and along the glassy lake, landing many passengers at every stage, and the fat matrons drank iced Chiavana beer, and the priests talked together in a little knot, and made merry among themselves. There were three of them, one rubicund, jovial, and somewhat threadbare, another very bent and toothless and humble, and desperately shabby, while the third, in shining broadcloth and a black satin waistcoat, carried himself like a gentleman and a man of the world, was liberal with the contents of his silver snuff-box, and had only to open his lips to evoke obsequious laughter. We landed the two first at small waterside hamlets by the way, and the last went ashore at Cadenabia in a smart boat with two rowers. Wooded hills, vineyards, villages, terraced gardens, gleaming villas bowered in orange groves, glided past meanwhile, a swift and beautiful panorama. The little voyage was soon over, and the sun was still high when we reached Bellagio, a haven of delicious rest, if only for a few hours. Next morning, however, by a quarter past seven, we were again on board and making, too slowly, for Lecco, where we arrived just in time to hear the parting whistle of the 9.25 train. Now, as there were only two departures a day from this place, and the next train would not start for seven hours, arriving in Venice close upon eleven at night, our case looked serious. We drove, however, to a hotel, apparently the best, and here the landlady, a bright, energetic body, proposed that we should take a carriage across the country to Bergamo, and there catch up the 1113 express from Milan. Here was the carriage standing ready in the courtyard. Here were the horses ready in the stables. Here was her nephew ready to drive us. The lightest carriage, the best horses, the steadiest whip in Lecco. Never was there so brisk a landlady. She allowed us no time for deliberation. She helped to put the horses in with her own hands, and she packed us off as eagerly as if the prosperity of her hotel depended on getting rid of her customers as quickly as possible. So away we went, counting the kilometers against the time all the way, and triumphantly rattling up to Bergamo station just twenty minutes before the express was due. Then came that well-known route, so full of beauty, so rich in old romance, that the mere names of the stations along the line make Bradshaw read like a page of poetry. Brescia, Verona, Vincenza, Padua, Venice. For the traveller who has gone over all this ground at his leisure, and is familiar with each place of interest as it flits by, I know no greater enjoyment than to pass them thus in rapid review, taking the journey straight through from Milan to Venice on a brilliant summer's day. What a series of impressions! What a chain of memories! What a long, bright vision of ancient cities with forked battlements, white convents perched on cypress-planted hills, rock-built citadels, and crumbling medieval towns, bright rivers and olive woods and vineyards without end, and beyond all these a background of blue mountains ever varying in outline, ever changing in hue, as the clouds sail over them and the train flies on. By five o'clock we were in Venice. I had not thought, when I turned southwards last autumn, that I should find myself threading its familiar waterways so soon again. I could hardly believe that here was the Grand Canal, and yonder the Rialto, and that those white domes now coming into sight were the domes of Santa Maria da Salute. It all seemed like a dream." and yet somehow it was less like a dream than a changed reality. It was Venice, but not quite the old Venice. It was a gayer, fuller, noisier Venice, a Venice empty of English and American tourists, full to overflowing of Italians in every variety of summer finery, crowded with artists of all nations sketching in boats, or surrounded by gaping crowds in shady corners and porticos a Venice whose flashing waters were now cloven by thousands of light skiffs with smart striped awnings of many colors, but whence the hearse-like tufted gondola, so full of mystery and poetry, had altogether vanished, a Venice whose every side canal swarmed with little boys learning to dive, and with swimmers of all ages, where dozens of cheap steamers, compared with which the Hungerford penny-boats would seem like floating palaces, were hurrying to and fro every quarter of an hour between the Riva del Chivone and the bathing-places on the Lido, a Venice in which every other house in every piazza had suddenly become a café, 
in which brass bands were playing and caramels were being hawked, and iced drinks were continually being consumed from seven in the morning till any number of hours after midnight. A Venice, in short, which was sunning itself in the brief gaiety and prosperity of the bathing season, when all Italy north of the Tiber, and a large percentage of strangers from Vienna, St. Petersburg, and the shores of the Baltic, throng hither to breathe the soft sea breezes off the Adriatic. We stayed three days at Danielli's, including Sunday, and mindful that we were this time bound for a district where roads were few, villages far between, and inns scantily provided with the commonest necessities, we took care to lay in a good store of portable provision for the journey. Our Saturday and Monday were therefore spent chiefly in the mazes of the Merceria. Here we bought two convenient wicker baskets, and wherewithal to stock them, tea, sugar, redding biscuits in tins, chocolate in tablets, Leidwig's Ramori extract, two bottles of cognac, four of marsala, pepper, salt, arrowroot, a large metal flask of spirits of wine, and an etna. Thus armed, we could at all events rely in case of need upon our own resources, and of milk, eggs, and bread we thought we might make certain everywhere. Time proved, however, that in the indulgence of even this modest hope we overestimated the fatness of the land, for it repeatedly happened that, the cows being gone to upper pastures, we could get no milk, and on one memorable occasion, in a hamlet containing at least three or four hundred souls, that we could get no bread. There was yet another point upon which we were severely exercised, and that was the question of side-saddles. Mr. R. on Monte Generoso had advised us to purchase them and take them with us, doubting whether we should find any between Cortina and Botzen. Another friend, however, had positively assured us of the existence of one at Capriel, and where there was one, we hoped, there might be two more. Anyhow, we were unwilling to add the bulk and burden of three side-saddles to our luggage, so we decided to go on and take our chance. I suspect, however, that we had no alternative, and that one might as well look for skates in Calcutta as for saddlery in Venice. As the event proved, we did ultimately succeed in capturing two side-saddles, the only two in the whole district, and in forcibly keeping them throughout the journey, but this was a triumph of audacity never to be repeated. Another time we should undoubtedly provide ourselves with side-saddles either at Padua or Vincenza on the one side, or at Botzen on the other. By Monday evening, the first of July, our preparations were completed, our provision baskets packed, our sections of sketching and writing materials duly laid in, and all was at length in readiness for an early start next morning. End of section two. Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys. Section 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys. A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites. By Amelia B. Edwards. Section 3. Chapter 2. Venice to Longarone. Part one. Having risen at grey dawn, breakfasted at a little after five a.m., and pulled down to the station before half the world of Venice was awake, it was certainly trying to find that we had missed our train by about five minutes, and must wait four hours for the next. Nor was it much consolation, though perhaps some little relief, to upbraid the courier who had slept too late, and so caused our misfortune. Sulky and silent, he piled our bags in a corner and kept gloomily aloof, while we, cold, dreary, and discontented, sat shivering in a draughty passage close against the ticket office, counting the weary hours and excluded even from the waiting rooms, which were locked up pour ordine supérieure, till half an hour before the time at which we could now proceed upon our journey. The time, however, dragged by somehow, and when, at ten o'clock, we at last found ourselves moving slowly out of the station, it seemed already like the middle of the day. And now again we traversed the great bridge, and the long, still, glassy space of calm lagoon, and left the lessening domes of Venice far behind. And now Mestra station being passed, and the firm earth reached again, 
we entered on a vast flat all green with blossoming Indian corn, and intersected by a network of broad dikes populous with frogs. Heavens! How they croaked! Driving out from Ravenna to Dante's famous pine forest the other day, we had been almost deafened by them. But the shrill chorus of those Ravenna frogs was as soft music compared with the unbridled revelry of the Venetian brethren. Those drowned the very noise of the train, and reduced us to dumb show till we were out of their neighborhood. So we sped on the gray-blue mountains that we had been looking at so longingly from Venice these last three days, growing gradually nearer and more definite. Soon we begin to distinguish a foreground of lower hilltops, some dark with woods, others cultivated from base to brow and dotted over with white villages. Then by and by comes a point, midway as it were between Venetia and Tyrol, whence, looking back towards Conegliano, we see the last tapering Venetian campanile, outlined against the horizon on the one hand, and the first bulbous Tyrolean steeple, shaped like the morion of a medieval man-at-arms, peeping above the roof of a little hillside hamlet on the other. The dikes and frogs are now left far behind. The line is bordered on both sides by feathery acacia hedges, and above the lower ranges of frontier mountains, certain strange jagged peaks, which, however, are not dolomite, begin to disengage themselves from the cloudy background of the northern sky. No, they cannot be dolomite, though they look so like it, for we have been told that we shall see no true dolomite before to-morrow. It is possible, however, as we know, to see the Antileo from Venice on such a clear day as befalls about a dozen times in the course of a summer, but here, even if the cloud were skyless, we are too close under the lower spurs of the outlying hills to command a view of greater heights beyond. Treviso comes next, apparently a considerable place. Here, according to Murray, is a fine annunciation of Titian to be seen in the Duomo, but we, alas, have no time to stay for it. Here also, as our fellow-traveller, the priest in the corner, says unctuously, opening his lips for the first and last time during the journey, they make good wine. Chi si fanno bambuino. At Treviso we drop a few third-class travellers, and being now just eighteen miles from Venice, and exactly half-way to Conegliano, go on again through a flat, flat country, past endless fields of maize and flats, past trailing vines reared, as in the Tyrol, on low slanting trellises close against the ground, past rich midsummer meadows where sunburnt peasants weigh knee-deep in wild flowers, and their flocks of turkeys are guessed at rather than seen, past villages and small stations and rambling farmhouses, and on towards the hills that are our goal. By and by, some four or five miles before Conegliano, the fertile plain is scarred by a broad tract of stones and sand, in the midst of which the Pieve, grey, shallow, and turbid, hurries towards the sea. Of this river we are destined to see and know more hereafter, among its native dolomites. And now we are at Conegliano, the last point to which the railway can take us, and which, in consequence of our four hours' delay this morning, we now have no time to see. And this is disappointing, for Conegliano must undoubtedly be worth a visit. We know of old palazzos decorated with fast-fading frescoes by Pordenone, of a theatre built by Segusinini, of an altar-piece in the Duomo by Sima of Conegliano, an exquisite early painter of this place, whose works are best represented in the Brera of Milan, and whose clear, dry, polished style holds somewhat of an intermediate place between that of Giovanni Bellini and Luca Signorelli. But if we would reach Longarone, our first stopping place to-night, we must go on, so all we carry away is the passing remembrance of a neat little station, a bright, modern-looking town about half a mile distant, a sprinkling of white villas dotted over the neighboring hillsides, and a fine old castle glowering down from a warlike height beyond. And now the guard's whistle shrills in our ears for the last time for many weeks, and the train, bound for Trieste, puffs out of the station, disappears round a curve, and leaves us on the platform with our pile of bags at our feet and all our adventures before us. We look in each other's faces. We feel for the moment as Martin Chuzzlewit may have felt when the steamer landed him at Eden and there left him. Nothing in truth can be more indefinite than our prospects 
more vague than our plans. We have Mayer's Maps, Ball's Guide to the Eastern Alps, Gilbert and Churchill's book, and all sorts of means and appliances, but we have not the slightest idea of where we are going, or of what we shall do when we get there. There is, however, no time now for misgivings, and in a few minutes we are again under way. Some three or four dirty post-omnibuses and bilious-looking yellow diligences are waiting outside, bound for Belluno and Longarone. Also one tolerable carriage with a pair of stout grey horses, which, after some bargaining, is engaged at the cost of a hundred lira. For this sum the driver is to take us to-day to Longarone, and to-morrow to Cortina in the Ampezzo Valley, a distance altogether of something like seventy English miles. So the bags are stowed away, some inside, some outside, and presently, without entering the town at all, we drive through a dusty suburb and out again onto the open plain. A straighter road across a flatter country it would be difficult to conceive. Bordered on each side by a row of thin poplars, and by interminable fields of Indian corn, it goes on for miles and miles, diminishing to a point in the far distance, like the well-known diagram of an avenue in perspective. And it is with peculiar attribute of this point to recede steadily in advance of us, so that we are always going on, as in a dreadful dream, and never getting any nearer. As for incidents by the way, there are none. We pass one of the lumbering yellow diligences that were standing erewhile at Conegliano Station. We see a few brown women hoeing in the Indian corn, and then for miles we neither pass a house nor meet a human being. It appears to me that hours must have gone by thus when I suddenly wake up, baked by the sun and choked by the dust, to find the whole party asleep, driver included, and the long distant hills now rising before us. Seeing a little town not a quarter of a mile ahead, a little town bright in sunshine against a background of dark woods, with a ruined castle on a height near by, I knew at once that this must be Senita, the Senita that Titian loved, and that yonder woods and hills and ruined castle are the same he took for the landscape background to his St. Peter martyr. Here he is said to have owned property and land, and at Manza, four miles off, he built himself a summer villa. Now, moved by some mysterious instinct, the driver wakes up just in time to crack his whip, put his horses into a gallop, and clatter, as foreign veterini love to clatter, through the one street which is the town. But in vain, for Canida, silent, solitary, basking in the sun, with every shutter closed and only a lean dog or two loitering aimlessly about the open space in front of the church, is apparently as sound asleep as an enchanted town in a fairy tale. Not a curtain is put aside, not a face peers out upon us as we rattle past. The very magpie in his wicker cage outside the barber's shop is dozing on his perch, and scarcely opens an eye, though we make noise enough to rouse the seven sleepers. Once past the houses we fall back, of course, into the old pace, the gracious hills drawing nearer and unfolding fresh details at every step. And now at last green slopes and purple crags close round our path. The road begins to rise, a steep and narrow gorge, apparently a mere cleft in the mountains like the gorge of Pfeffers, opens suddenly before us, and from the midst of a nest of vines, mulberry trees and chestnuts, the brown roofs and campaniles of Serraval lift themselves into sight. Serraval, though it figures on the map in smaller type than Canida, which is, or was, an Episcopal residence, is yet a much more considerable place covering several acres, and straggling up into the mouth of the gorge, through which the Mescio comes hurrying to the plain. Strictly speaking, perhaps, there is now no Canida and no Serraval, the two townships having been united of late by the Italian government under the name of Vittoria, but they lie a full mile apart, and no one seems as yet to take kindly to the new order of things. Again our driver cracks his whip and urges his horses to a canter, and so, with due magnificence, we clatter into the town, a quaint, picturesque, crumbling, world-forgotten place, with old stone houses abutting on the torrent, and a duomo that looks as if it had been left unfinished three hundred years ago, and gloomy arcades vaulting the footways on each side of the principal street, as in Strasbourg and Bern. 
Dashing across the bridge and into the piazza, we pull up before one of the two inns which there compete for possession of the infrequent traveller. For Saraval boasts not only a piazza and a duomo, but two albergi, two shabby little cafés, a regia posta, and even a lottery office with Chi si guilcono por Venezia painted in red letters across the window. Here, too, the inhabitants are awake and stirring. They play at dominoes in their shirt-sleeves outside the cafés. They play at mora in the shade of doorways and arcades. They fill water-jars, wash lettuces, and gossip at the fountain. They even patronize the drama, as may be seen by the erection of a temporary puppet theatre, patronized by His Majesty the King of Italy and all the sovereigns of Europe, on a slope of waste ground close against the church. Nor is wanting the usual score or two of idle men and boys who immediately start up from nowhere in particular, and swarm open-mouthed about the carriage, staring at its occupants as if they were members of a travelling menagerie. But Saraville has something better than puppets and an idle population to show. The Duomo contains a large painting of the Madonna and Child in Glory, by Titian, executed to order some time between the years 1542 and 1547, a grand picture belonging to what may perhaps be called the second order of the master's greatest period, and of which it has been lately said by an eminent traveller and critic that it would alone repay a visit to Saraville, even from Venice. With respect to the treatment of this fine work, Mr. Gilbert, whose admirable book on Titian and Cadore leaves nothing for any subsequent writer to add on these subjects, says, It is one of the grandest specimens of the master, and in very fair preservation. It represents the virgin and child in glory surrounded by angels, who fade into the golden haze above. Heavy-volumed clouds support and separate from earth this celestial vision, and below, standing on each side, are the colossal and majestic figures of St. Andrew and St. Peter, the former supporting a massive cross, the latter holding aloft, as if challenging denial of his faithfulness, the awful keys. Between these two noble figures, under a low horizon line, is a dark lake amidst darker hills, where a distant sail recalls the fisherman and his craft composition, drawing, color, are all dignified and worthy of the master. Cadore, page 43. End of section 3, chapter 2, part 1. Section 4 of Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys A Midsummer Ramble in the Dolomites by Amelia B. Edwards Section 4 Chapter 2 Venice to Longarone Part 2 And now, time pressing, the day advancing, and three-fourths of the drive yet lying before us, we must push on, or Longarone will not be reached ere nightfall. So having been sufficiently stared at, not only by the population generally, but by the landlord and landlady and everybody connected with the inn, as well as by the domino players who leave their games to take part in the entertainment, we clatter off again and make straight for the rocky mouth of the gorge, now closing in upon, and apparently swallowing up, the long line of old stone houses creeping into the defile. Some of these, shattered and decaying as they are, show traces of Venetian Gothic in pointed agave windows, and delicate twisted column. They belong, no doubt, to wealthy owners in the days when Titian used to ride over from Manza to visit his married daughter who lived at Saraville. Where the houses end, the precipice is so close in that there is but just space for the road and the torrent. Then the gorge gradually widens through wooded slopes and hanging chestnut groves, Farmhouses and chalets, perched high on grassy plateaus, begin to look more Swiss than Italian. Mountains and forests all round shut in the view, and about two miles from Saraville the Machio expands into a tiny, green, transparent lake, tranquil as cloudless evening sky, and fringed by a broad border of young flax. A single skiff, reflected upside down as in a mirror, floats idly in the middle of the lake. The fisherman in it seems to be asleep. 
Not a ripple, not a breath, disturbs the placid picture in the water. Every hill and tree is there, reversed, and every reed is doubled. This delicious pool, generally omitted in the maps, is the Lago di Seraville. Woods slope down to the brink on one side, and the road, skirting the debris of an old landslip, winds round the other. Two tiny white houses with green jalousies and open Italian balconies at the head of the lake, a toy church on a grassy knoll, and a square medieval watch-tower clinging to a ridge of rock above, make up the details of a picture so serene and perfect that even Turner, at his sunniest period, could scarcely have idealized it. The gorge now goes on widening and becomes a valley, once the scene of a bergfall so gigantic that it is supposed to have turned the course of the Piave, flowing out till then by Saraville, and to have sent it thenceforward and forever through the Val de Mel. This catastrophe happened ages ago, most probably in prehistoric times, yet the great barrier, six hundred feet in height from this side, looks as if it might be less than a century old. Few shrubs have taken root in these vast hillocks of slaty debris, among and over which the road continually rises. Few mosses have gathered in the crannies of these monster blocks which lie piled like fallen towers by the wayside. All is bare, ghastly, desolate. As we mount higher, the outlying trees of a great beech forest on the verge of a lofty plateau to the right are pointed out by the driver as the famous Bosco de Consiglio, a name that dates back to old Venetian rule, when these woods furnished timber to the state. Hence came the wood of which the Bucentaur was built, and, who knows, perhaps the merchant ships of Antonio and the war galley in which blind old Dandolo put forth against the Turk. Presently, being now about four miles from Saraville, and the top of the great bergfall not yet reached, we come upon another little green, clear lake, about the size of the last, the Lago Morto. It lies down in a hollow below the road, close under a huge, sheer precipice, blinding white in the sunshine, whence half the mountain side looks as if it had been sliced away at a blow. If it were not that the debris could hardly be piled up where and how it is, leaving that hollow in which the lake lies sleeping, one would suppose this to be the spot whence the rock slip came, what time it barred out the Piave from the gorge of Saraville. According to the local legend, no boat can live upon those tranquil waters, and no bather who plunges into them may ever swim back to shore. Both are, in some terrible way, drawn down and engulfed deeper than ever did plummet sound. It is said, however, that the last Austrian governor of Lombardo Venetia, being anxious to put an end to the superstition, brought up a boat from the Santa Croce side, and, in the presence of a breathless crowd from all the neighboring villages, himself rowed the pretty wife of the Fidalto postmaster across the lake, and landed her triumphantly upon the opposite shore. Your Tyrolean peasant, however, is not easily disabused of ancient errors, and the Lago Morto, I am told, notwithstanding that public rehabilitation, enjoys its evil reputation to this day. At length, having the Bosco de Consiglio always to the right, and the Col Vincentino with its scattered snowdrifts towering to the left, we gain the summit of the ridge and see the lake of Santa Croce, looking wonderfully like the lake of Albano, lying close beneath our feet. Great mountains, all gray and purple crags above, all green cornfields and wooded slopes below, enclose it in a nest of verdure. The village and church of Santa Croce, perched on a little grassy bluff, almost overhang the water. Other villages and campaniles sparkle far off on shore and hillside, while yonder, through a gap in the mountains at the farther end of the lake, we are startled by a strange apparition of pale, fantastic peaks, lifted high against the northern horizon. Echo! says the driver, pointing towards them with his whip, and half turning round to watch the effect of his words. Ecco i nostri dolomiti. The announcement is so unexpected that for the first moment it almost takes one's breath away. Having been positively told that no dolomites would come into sight before the second day's journey, we have neither been looking for them nor expecting them, and yet there they are, so unfamiliar and yet so unmistakable. One feels immediately that they are unlike all other mountains, and yet that they are exactly what one expected them to be. 
Che dolomiti sono? Come si chiamano? What dolomites are they? What are their names? Are the eager questions that follow. But the bare geological fact is all our driver has to tell. They are dolomites, dolomites on the Italian side of the frontier. He knows no more, so we can only turn to our maps and guess by comparison of distances and positions that these flustered equiles belong most probably to the range of Montes Fornioi. At Santa Croce we halt for half an hour before the door of an extremely dirty little albergo, across the front of which is painted in conspicuous letters, Chi si vende buon vino a civuali. Leaving the driver and courier to test the truth of this legend, we order coffee and drink it in the open air. The horses are taken out and fed. The rider, grievously tormented by a plague of flies, makes a sketch under circumstances of untold difficulty, being presently surrounded by the whole population of the place, among whom are some three or four handsome young women with gay red and yellow handkerchiefs bound round their heads like turbans. These damsels are by no means shy. They crowd, they push, they chatter, they giggle. One invites me to take her portrait. Another wishes to know if I am married. A third discovers that I am like a certain Maria Rosa, whom they all seem to know, whereupon every feature of my face is discussed separately, and for the most part to my disparagement. At this trying juncture L, in a moment of happy inspiration, offers to show them the chromolithographs in Gilbert and Churchill's book, and so creates a diversion in my favor. Meanwhile, the flies settle upon me in clouds, walk over my sky, drown themselves in the water bottles, and leave their legs in the brown matter. Despite all which impediments, however, I achieve my sketch, and by the time the horses are put to, I am ready to go on again. The road now skirts the lake of Santa Croce, at the head of which extends an emerald green flat wooded with light, feathery, yellowish poplars, evidently at one time part of the bed of the lake, from which the waters have long since retreated. From this point we follow the line of the valley, passing the smart new village of Cadola, and at Capo di Point, whence the valley of Seraville and the Val de Mil diverge at right angles, come again upon the Piave, now winding in and out among stony hillocks, like the Rhone at Luc, and milk-white from its glacier source in the upper Dolomites. The old bridge at Capo di Point, the old bridge which dated from Venetian times, is now gone, and with it the buttresses adorned with the line of St. Mark mentioned by Ball and alluded to in Mr. Gilbert's Cadore. Fragments of the ancient piers may yet be traced, but a new and very slight-looking iron bridge now spans the stream some fifty yards higher up. At Capo di Point, the most unscientific observer cannot fail to see that the Piave must once upon a time, most probably when the great Bergfall drove its waters back from Seraville, have here formed another lake, the great natural basin of which yet remains, with the river flowing through it in a low secondary channel. And now the road enters another straight and narrow valley, the valley of the Piave, closed in far ahead by a rugged dolomite, all teeth and needle points. By this time the long day is drawing to a close. Cows after milking are being driven back to pasture. Laborers are plodding homewards, and a party of country girls with red handkerchiefs upon their heads, wading knee-deep through the wild flowers of a wayside meadow, look like a procession of animated puppies. Then the sun goes down, the sky and the mountains turn cold and gray, and just before dusk sets we arrive at Longarone. A large rambling village with a showy Renaissance church and a few shabby shops, a big desolate inn with stone staircases and stone floors, a sullen landlord, a frightened, barefooted chambermaid who looks as if she had just been caught wild in the mountains, bedrooms like barns, floors without carpets, windows without curtains, such are our first comfortless impressions of Longarone. Nor are these impressions in any wise modified by more intimate acquaintance. We dine in a desert of sitting-room at an oasis of table, lighted by a single tallow candle. The food is indifferent and indifferently cooked. The wine is the worst we have had in Italy. Meanwhile, a stern and ominous look of satisfaction settles on the countenance of the great man whom we have so ruthlessly torn from the sphere he habitually adorns. 
I told you so, is written in every line of his face, and in the very bristle of his moustache. At last, being dismissed for the night, and told at what hour to have the carriage round in the morning, he can keep silence no longer. "'We shall not meet with many inns so good as this, where we are going,' he says, grimly triumphant. "'Good night, ladies,' and with this parting shot, retires. My bedroom that night measures thirty-five feet in length by twenty-five in breadth, and is enlivened by five windows and four doors. The windows look out variously upon street, courtyard, and stables. The doors lead endlessly to suites of empty, shut-up rooms, and all sorts of intricate passages. Tis as ghostly, echoing, suicidal a place to sleep in as I ever saw in my life. End of section 4, chapter 2, part 2. And Unfrequented Valleys Section 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites Section 5 Chapter 3 Longarone de Cortina, Part 1 Longarone, seen at six o'clock on a grey, dull morning, looked no more attractive than at dusk the evening before. There had been thunder and heavy rain in the night, and now the road and footways were full of muddy pools. The rider, however, was up betimes, wandering alone through the wet streets, peeping into the tawdry churches, spelling over the framed and glazed announcements of births, deaths, and marriages at the Prefectura, sketching the Piccalina, a solitary, conspicuous peak over against the mouth of the Val Vaillant, on the opposite bank of the Piave, and seeking such scattered crumbs of information as might fall in her way. To sketch, even so early as six a.m., without becoming the nucleus of a crowd, is, of course, impossible, and the crowd this time consisted of school-children of all ages, quite as untamable and almost as numerous as the flies of Santa Croce. Presently, however, came by a mild, plump priest in a rusty sultane, who chased the truants off to the parish schoolhouse, and himself lingered for a little secular chat by the way. He had not much to tell, yet he told the little that he knew pleasantly and readily. The parish, he said, numbered about three thousand souls, a pious, industrious folk mainly supported by the timber trade, which is the staple of these parts. This timber, being cut, sold, and branded in the Empeso Thau, is floated down the Boata to its point of convergence with the Piave, at Perarolo, and thence, carried by the double current, comes along the valley of the Piave and the Val de Mel, to be claimed by its several purchasers along the banks, and caught as it passes by. Thus it is that every village by the way is skirted by sawmills and timber-yards, and that almost every man is a carpenter. He then went on to tell me that my peak was called the Piccalina, or Hen's Beak, that there existed a practicable short-cut for pedestrians by way of the Val Vaillant to Udine and the Trieste Railway, that the Gran Tiziano was born on the banks of the Piave higher up, at Piave de Cadore, that the Dolomites were the highest mountains in the world, which I am afraid I pretended to believe, that the large church in the Piazza was the church of the Consenzione, that the little church at the back, dedicated to San Liberale, was the smallest church in Italy, which no doubt was true, seeing that you might put it inside St. Lawrence, under cliff, and yet leave a passage to walk round, and finally that Cazzo Lavazzo, seen from a point about a quarter of a mile farther on, was the most picturesque view in the valley, and the best worth sketching. Having delivered himself of which information, apocryphal and otherwise, he lifted his shovel hat with quite the air of a man of the world, and bade me good morning. Of course I went at once in search of the view of Castle Lavasso, and finding it really characteristic of the Val de Pieve, succeeded in sketching it before it was time to return to breakfast. By nine we were on the road again, following the narrow gorge that was soon to lead us into the real world of Dolomite. The morning was now alternately bright and showery, and the dark, jagged peaks that closed in the distance were of just that rich, deep, incredible ultramarine blue that Titian loved and painted so often in his landscape backgrounds. 
At Termine, a little timber-worked hamlet noisy with sawmills, about a mile beyond Cazzolavazzo, the defile narrows so suddenly that one gigantic gray and golden crag seems to block the end of the village street. The women here are handsome, and wear folded cloths upon their heads, as in the hills near Rome, and the men wear wooden clogs, as at Lugano. A slender waterfall wavers down the face of a cliff on the opposite side of the river. Primitive breakwaters, like huge baskets of rude wickerwork filled with stones, here stem the force of the torrent brawling through its narrow bed, and some of these have had their place so long that young trees have had time to take root and flourish in them. Next comes Ospitale, another little brown-roofed hamlet perched on a green rise like Castellavazzo, with the usual cluster of sawmills and saw-pits down by the water's edge. And now, entering the commune of Perarolo in a smart shower, we rattle through a succession of tiny villages built in the Swiss way, with wooden balconies, outer staircases, and deep projecting eaves. In most of these places, it being now between ten and eleven o'clock a.m., the good people are sitting in their doorways, dining primitively out of wooden bowls. So we go on, and so the piave, greenish in color, interrupted by a thousand rapids, noisy, eager, headlong, comes ever rushing towards us, and past us, and away to the sea. So, too, the brown and gold pine trunks come whirling down with the stream. It is curious to watch them in their course, some singly, some in crowds, some blunder along sideways in a stupid, buffeted, bewildered way, some plunge madly up and down, some run races, some get tired, rest a while under the shelter of the bank, and then, with a rouse and a shake, dash back again into the throng. Others creep into little stony shallows, and there go to sleep for days and weeks together, while others again push straight ahead, nose first, as if they knew what they were about, and were bent on getting to their journey's end as quickly as possible. Nearing Perarolo, glimpses of the peaks, anguils, and snowfields of Monte Credola, 8,474 feet, the highest point of the Prima Maggiore range, are now and then seen to the right, through the openings in the lower mountains. Montezuco abruptly blocks the end of the gorge. Country carts upon the road, women working in the fields, a party of children scrambling and shouting among the bushes by the wayside, now indicate that we are not far from a more thickly inhabited place than any of the preceding villages. Then the road takes a sudden turn, and Perarolo, with its handsome new church, new stone bridge, public fountain, extensive wood-yards, and general air of solid prosperity comes into view. Yet a few yards farther, and a second bridge is crossed, a new valley rich in wood and water opens away to the left, and a wonderful, majestic vision, draped in vapors and hooded in clouds, stands suddenly before us. The coachman, preparing his accustomed coup de theatre, is not allowed to speak. We know at once in what presence we are. We know at once that yonder vague and shadowy mass which shores beyond our side and seems to gather up the slopes of the valley, as a robe, can be none other than the Antileo. A grand but a momentary sight. The coachman, with a jealous glance at the open maps and guidebooks that have forestalled his information, whips on his horses, and in another moment valley and mountain are lost in the turn of the road, and we are fast climbing the hill leading to the great zigzag of Montezuco. Still we have seen, however imperfectly, the loftiest of all the giants of Cadore. We have seen the mouth of the famous Ampeso Thal, and we begin to feel that it is not all a dream, that we are among the Dolomites at last. And now, for a weary while, partly on foot and partly in the carriage, we toil on and on up the new road constructed of late years by the Emperor Ferdinand. The Piave, here quite choked by a huge stationary mass of pine trunks, winds unheard some hundreds of feet below. Perarolo, the great center of all this timber trade, dwindles to a toy hamlet in the valley. New peaks rise on the horizon. New valleys glitter in the distance. Still the road climbs, winds among vast slopes of pine forests, makes the entire circuit of Montezuco, and finally, with one long last pull, reaches the level of the upper plateau. 
Here, at Tai Cadore, a tiny village backed by cultivated slopes, we are to take our midday rest. Here, too, we catch our first glimpse of Titian's birthplace, Pieve de Cadore, a small white hamlet nestled in a fold of the hills close under a ruined castle on a wooded knoll, about a mile away. Now Pieve de Cadore was down in our route as a special excursion to be taken hereafter from Cortina in the Ampezzo Valley, but our impatience was great, and the sun was shining brilliantly, and our first thought was to employ these two hours' rest in walking there and back, and just seeing, though it were only the outside of it, the house in which the great painter was born. It was first necessary, however, to take luncheon at Tai, which we did, seated at a bare table in an upper room of the clean little inn, beside a window commanding a magnificent view of the Premagiore range. Meanwhile the capricious sky clouded over again, and by the time we should have been ready to start, the rain was coming down so heavily that Pieve de Cadore was unavoidably left to be seen later on. A little way beyond Tai Cadore begins one of the finest drives in Europe. The road that enters the Ampezzo Thal at an elevation which can scarcely be less than twelve hundred and fifty feet above the foaming Biota, and a close, lofty, richly wooded valley, like a sublimer Val d'Ansaza, opens the way to more rugged scenery beyond. Vast precipices tower above, scattered villages cling to the green slopes halfway down, and brilliant passages of light and shadow move rapidly over all. Now one peak is lighted up, and now another. Here a brown roof, wet from the last shower, glistens like silver in the sunshine. There a grassy slope fringed with noble chestnuts glows in a green and golden light, while on yonder opposite height a dark fir forest shows blue and purple in an angry storm shadow. At Vanus the overhanging eaves, outer staircases, and balustrated balconies are wholly Swiss, while inscriptions such as Qui si vende vina di asti, colonial, et altri generari, remind us that, although close upon the Austrian frontier, we are not yet out of Italy. And now the valley widens. The Antileo, still obscured by floating mists, again comes into sight, a near mass of clustered pinnacles, then the Pelmo on the opposite side of the valley, uplifted in the likeness of a mighty throne canopied by clouds, and approached by a giant staircase, each step of which is a precipice laden with eternal snow, and trodden only by the chamois hunter. Next, on the same side as the Pelmo, but farther up the valley, appears the Rochetta, a chain of wild, confused crags like a line of broken battlements, piled high on huge buttresses of sward and pine forest. Beneath the small wayside hamlets of Vodo and Borca the road is cut through an enormous slope of stony debris, the scene of a bergfall which fell from the Antileo in 1816, and overwhelmed two villages on the opposite bank of the Boita. More sudden and almost more cruel than the lava from Vesuvius, it came down, as almost every bergfall comes down, at dead of night, crushing the sleepers in their beds and leaving not a moment for escape. End of section 5《Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys》Section 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys a Midsummer Ramble in the Dolomites by Amelia B. Edwards Chapter 3 Longarone de Cortina, Part 2 Two great mounds of shattered limestone, each at least one hundred feet in height, mark the site of the lost villages, and strange to tell the torrent, instead of being dammed and driven back as at Saraval, flows on its way unimpeded save by a few titanic boulders. How so tremendous a fall could have crossed the stream in sufficient volume to bury every house, church, and campanile on the other side, and yet have failed to fill up the bed of the intervening torrent, is infinitely mysterious. I inquired then, and later, whether the stream might not have been temporarily choked, and afterwards cleared by the labor of the other Ampesan communities. 
but though all whom I asked seemed to think such a task impossible of fulfillment at any time, none could answer me. It happened, Signora, fifty-six years ago, was the invariable answer. Chilosa. Was that so long a time? It seemed strange that after the lapse of little more than half a century, every detail of so terrible a catastrophe should be forgotten in a place where events were necessarily few. And now, following the great sweep of the road, we make at least one-third of the circuit of the Antileo, which becomes momentarily grander and changes its aspect and outline with every turn. The snow on this side finds no resting place, save on a scant ledge here and there, and the mountain consists apparently of innumerable jagged buttresses, huge slopes of shaly debris, and an infinitely varied chain of pallid peaks and pinnacles. Some of these are almost white, some of a pale, sulphurous yellow streaked with violet, some splashed with a vivid, rusty red, indicating the presence of iron. One keen, splintered anguille, sharp as a lance and curved as a shark's tooth, looked like a scimitar freshly dipped in blood. Now, at San Vito, the Antilau begins to be left behind, and the long ridge of the Croda Malcora, with its highest peak, Sorapis, standing boldly out against a background of storm-cloud, enters on the scene. A little farther yet, and the Austrian frontier is reached. A striped pole, alternately black and yellow, like a leg of one of the Pope's guard, bestride the road in front of a dilapidated little custom-house. Here some three or four ragged-looking Austrian soldiers are playing at bowls, while a couple of officers lounging in a bench outside the door smoke their cigarettes and watch the game. One of these, very tall, very shabby, very dirty, with a glass screwed into his eye and a moustache about eighteen inches in length, saunters up to the carriage door. Being assured, however, that we carry nothing contraband, he lifts his cap with an indescribable air of fashionable languor, and bids the coachman drive on. From this point, the invisible political line being passed, one observes an immediate change, not only in the costumes, but in the build and features of the people. They are a taller, fairer, finer race. The men wear rude capes of undressed skins. The women, no longer bare-legged, no longer coiffied with red and yellow handkerchiefs, wear a kind of Bernese dress consisting of a black petticoat, a black cloth bodice like a tightly fitting waistcoat, white linen undersleeves reaching to the elbow, a large blue apron, and a round felt hat like a man's. By this time the Pelmo is out of sight, the Rochetta is left behind, Sorapis is passed, and still new mountains rise against the horizon. To the left, a continuation, indeed, of the Rochetta, the Bec di Mazzotti and the ridge of Boccolungo stand out like a row of jagged teeth. On a line with these, but at least a mile farther up the valley, the huge bulk of the Tofana looms up in sullen majesty, headed by a magnificent precipice, like a pyramid of red granite. While to the right, Monte Cristallo, a stupendous chevaux de frise of grey and orange pinnacles, forms a grand background to the clustered roofs, lofty campanile, and green pasturages of Cortina. For at last we are in sight of the place which is to be our headquarters for the next week, and the wonderful drive is nearly at an end. Already within the compass of some fifteen English miles, i.e., from Tay to Cortina, we have seen six of the most famous Dolomites, three on the right bank and three on the left of the Boita. Four out of the six succeed ten thousand five hundred feet in height while the Antileo is, I believe, distanced by only two of its rivals, namely the Marmolata and the Simon della Pala. The new and amazing forms of these colossal mountains, their strange colouring, the mystery of their formation, the singularity of their relative positions, each being so near its neighbour, yet in itself so distinct and isolated, the curious fact that they are all so nearly of one height, their very names so unlike the names of all other mountains, high-sounding, majestic, like relics of a prehistoric tongue, all these sights and facts in sudden combination confuse the imagination, and leave one bewildered at first by the variety and rapidity 
with which impression after impression has been charged upon the memory. It was therefore almost with a sense of relief that, weary with wonder and admiration, we found ourselves approaching the end of the day's journey. And now the road, which has been gradually descending for many miles, enters Cortina at about four hundred feet above the level of the Boita. First comes a scattered house or two, then a glimpse of the old church, the cemetery, and the public shooting ground, in a hollow down near the river, then a long, irregular street of detached homesteads, hostelries, and humble shops. The new campanile, the pride of the village, two hundred and fifty feet in height, the post-house at the corner of a little piazza containing a public fountain, and finally, being the last house in the place, the Aquila Nera, a big, substantial albergo built in true Tyrolean fashion, like a colossal Noah's Ark, with rows upon rows of square windows with bright green shutters, and a huge roof with jutting eaves that looks as if it ought to take off like a lid to let out the animals inside. This, then, is our destination, and here we arrive towards close of day, rattling through the village and dashing up to the door with our driver's usual flourish, just as if the greys, instead of having done thirty-five miles to-day and thirty-four yesterday, were quite fresh, and only now out of the stable. The Gadinas, father and two sons, come out, not with much alacrity, to bid us welcome. The writer, however, mentions a name of might, the name of Francis Fox Tuckett, and behold, it acts upon the sullen trio like a talisman. Their good will breaks forth in a ludicrous melody of Italian and German. How! The Signora is a friend of Il Tuckett, of the grand brave Signore, whose achievements are famed throughout all these valleys? Gott in Himmel! Shall not the whole house be at her disposal? Echo! The Aquila Nera will justify the recommendation of Il Brave Tucket. Hereupon we alight. The old landlord puts out an enormous brown paw. We shake hands all around. The Kelnerian is summoned. The best rooms are assigned to us. The cooks, and there seem to be plenty of them in the huge gloomy kitchen, are set to work to prepare supper. A table is laid for us on the landing, which, as we find henceforth, is the place of honor in every inn throughout the Dolomite Tyrol, and all that the Aquila Nera contains is laid under contribution for our benefit. It is a thorough Tyrolean hostelry, by no means scrupulously clean, yet better provided and more spacious than one would have expected to find, even in this, the most important village of the district. The bedrooms are immense, though scantily furnished. A few small mats of wolf and chamois skins are laid about here and there, but there is not such a thing as a carpet in the house. At the Dépendance, however, a new building on the opposite side of the road, charmingly decorated with external frescoes by one of the younger Gedinas who is an artist in Vienna, there are smaller rooms to be had, with good iron bedsteads and some few modern comforts. But we knew nothing of this till a day or two after, when we were glad to move into the more quiet house, though at the cost of having always to cross over for meals. In the way of food a kind of rough plenty reigns. Luxuries, of course, are out of the question, but of veal, sausage, eggs, cheese, and sauerkraut there is abundance. Drovers, guides, peasant farmers and travellers of all grades are eating, drinking, smoking all day long in the public rooms of which there are at least four in the lower floors of the big house. The kitchen chimney is smoking, the cooks are cooking, the taps are running from morn till dewy eve. We arrive at dewy eve, come in for an all-pervading atmosphere of tobacco and garlic, the accumulated incense of the day's sacrifices. With all this plenty, however, and all this custom, the wealthiest and most fastidious traveller must fare off the same meats and drinks as the poorest. The only foreign wine that Gedina keeps in his cellar is a rough Piedmontese vintage called Vino Barbera, which costs about two francs the bottle. If you do not like that, you must drink beer, or thin country wine, either red or white, or an inexpressibly nauseous spirit distilled from the root of a small plant nearly resembling the ordinary Plantago Major, or common English plantain. An inferior kind of Kirschwasser is, I believe, also to be had, but as for brandy, I doubt if there is one drop to be found in the whole country between Belluno and Brunec. 
For the rest the inn is well enough, though one feels the want of a mistress in the establishment. Gedina Pear is a wealthy widower, and his three stalwart sons, all unmarried, live at home and attend, in a grim, unwilling way, to the housekeeping and stabling. Their horses, by the way, are first-rate, far too good for rough country work, while in the adjoining outbuildings are to be found a capital landau, a light chaise, some three or four caratini, and a side-saddle. How this article, in itself neither rare nor beautiful, came presently to occupy the foremost place in our affections and desires, how we fought for its possession against all comers, how we begged it, borrowed it, and finally stole it, will be seen hereafter. Meanwhile, arriving late and tired, we were glad to accept the big rooms in the big house, to put up with the atmosphere, to sup on the larding, to hear downstairs revellers going away long after we were in bed, and even to be wakened by the wild cry of the village watchman at intervals all through the dark hours of the night. It was not, perhaps, quite so agreeable to be aroused next morning at earliest dawn by a legion of carpenters in the street below flinging down loads of heavy planks, driving in posts by the wayside, hammering, shouting, and making noise enough to wake not only the living but the dead. For this, however, as for every discomfort, there was the compensation at hand, and our satisfaction was great on being told that the grand yearly sagro, or church festival, would be celebrated a few days hence, and that our noisy friends outside were already beginning to erect booths in preparation for the annual fair, which is held at the same time. It is the most important fair in all this part of the Austrian and Italian Tyrol, and is attended by an average concourse of from twelve to fifteen hundred peasants from every hill and valley for nearly thirty miles round about Cortina. End of section six. Untrodden peaks and unfrequented valleys. Section seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys, A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites by Amelia B. Edwards Chapter 4 At Cortina, Part 1 Situated on the left bank of the Boita, which here runs nearly due north and south, with the Tre Croce Pass opening away behind the town to the east, and the Tresasse Pass widening before it to the west, Cortina lies in a comparatively open space between four great mountains, and is therefore less liable to danger from bergfalls than any other village, not only in the Val d'Ampezzo, but in the whole adjacent district. For the same reason it is cooler in summer than either Capriel, Agordo, Primario, or Prodazzo, all of which, though more central as stopping places, and in many respects more convenient, are yet somewhat too closely hemmed in by surrounding heights. The climate of Cortina is temperate throughout all the year. Ball gives the village an elevation of 4,048 feet above the level of the sea, and one of the parish priests, an intelligent old man who has devoted many years of his life to collecting the flora of the Ampezzo, assured me that he had never known the thermometer to drop so low as fifteen degrees of frost even in the coldest winters. The soil, for all this, has a bleak and barren look. The maize, here called Grano Turco, grows thin and hungerly, and the vine is unknown. But then agriculture is not a specialty of the Ampezzo Thal, and the wealth of Cortina is derived essentially from its pasture lands and florists. These last, in consequence of the increase and the increasing value of timber, have been lavishly cut down of late years by the commune, too probably at the expense of the future interests of Cortina. For the present, however, every inn, homestead, and public building bespeaks prosperity. The inhabitants are well fed and well dressed. Their fairs and festivals are the most considerable in all the south-eastern Tyrol, their principal church is the largest this side of St. Ulrich, and their new Gothic campanile, two hundred and fifty feet high, might suitably adorn the piazza of such a city as Bergamo or Belluno. The village contains about seven hundred souls, but the population of the commune numbers over twenty-five hundred. 
of these the greater part old and young rich and poor men women and children are engaged in the timber trade some cut the wood some transport it the wealthy convey it on trucks drawn by fine horses which however are cruelly overworked the poor harness themselves six or eight in a team men women and boys together and so under the burning summer sun drag loads that look as if they might be too much for an elephant going out as usual before breakfast the morning of the day following our arrival at cortina the first sight that met my eyes was a very old woman perhaps eighty years of age and a sick little boy of about ten roped to a kind of rough sledge piled up with at least half a ton weight of rough planks eight o'clock mass is performed at each church alternatively every morning throughout the year to-day it happened to be down at the old church and thither attracted by their quaint costumes i followed a party of chattering peasant girls some of whom had their milk cans and market baskets in their hands these they carried into the church taking off their hats at the door like men and remaining uncovered throughout the service the congregation consisted of some three or four score of very old women with scant white poles a sprinkling of square-headed robust-looking damsels with silver pins in their cubbed and plaited hair and a few old men so tanned and gnarled and bent that they looked as if carved out of rough brown wood then trooped noisily in some four hundred children of both sexes and filled the benches next to the altar while the old bell-ringer having rung his last peal came hobbling up the aisle in heavy wooden clogs and baggy breeches and lit the candles on the altar presently appeared a priest in black and gold vestments attended by little red-headed acolyte like one of john bellini's angels the organist by no means a bad player led off with a la mort on a tremolo stop the congregation dropped on their knees and the service began musically speaking it was one of those performances which one enjoys the more the less one hears of it a showy operatic mass by some italian composer a reedy organ and a choir that might have been better trained made up an ensemble that soon sent the writer creeping towards the door it was delightful to get out again into the glorious morning the sun was now shining deliciously the air was heavy with the scent of new-mown hay and the birds were singing their own little hymn of praise in a way that turned the cortina choir to unmitigated discord it was one of those mornings steeped in dewy freshness when distant sounds and sights are brought supernaturally near when lights are strangely bright and shadows transparent and the very mountains look more awake than usual even tofana rarely seen without a turban of storm-cloud rose sharp and clear to-day against the sky just opposite the old church lies the village cemetery the gate stood ajar and i went in not certainly expecting to find the god's acre of this wealthy commune a mere weed-grown wilderness but so it was here a confusion of rough stone heaps marking the graves of the poor yonder a few marble tablets and iron crosses against the wall recording the names of the better class dead everywhere coarse deep grass thistles nettles loose stones broken pottery and trampled clay a couple of hand beers a pile of black trestles a spade and a coil of rope lay ready for use under a stone arcade at the farther end of the enclosure not a flower was there not a touch of poetry or pathos in the place nothing but indifference irreverence and neglect this ugly sight somehow brought back the recollection of an alms-box that i had seen not long ago outside a pretty little cemetery near luino bearing the following inscription messa funerale nel noma della beata maria carita por noi funeral masses we implore charity in the name of the blessed mary this appeal coming like a voice from the dead had struck me at the time as very awful but here it would have been still more awful and more appropriate going homewards i found sheds and booths of all sizes springing up the whole length of the village street and a great wooden enclosure like a circus being erected in the piazza opposite the albergo of the stella d'oro a huge colored poster representing feats of the trapeze clowns human pyramids and the like pasted on a space of blank wall close by 
sufficiently accounted for the shape and size of this building. "'But what is the segro?' I asked of a young priest who was gravely watching the carpenters at their work. "'Is it a fair?' "'It is a festival of the church, signora,' he replied with an air of reproof, and walked away. A segro, however, as I soon came to know, is both a fair and a religious festival, and takes place once a year in every village on the anniversary of the consecration of the church, or on the festa of the saint to whom the church is dedicated. And there are so many villages scattered about the country that a segro is said to be going on somewhere every day in the year." Hurrying back now to breakfast, I found the Gedinas, our courier, and a group of guides and peasants assembled outside the door of the Aquilanera, staring up at the rugged peak known as the Be di Mazadi, on the opposite of the valley. Telescopes were being passed from hand to hand amid exclamations of, Eccoli! Brave signora! Brave inglese! And old Gedina, steadying his own glass for me against an angle of wall, bade me look up yonder for my countrymen. Two English gentlemen then staying with their wives in the dependence of the Aquilinera had, it seemed, this morning achieved the first ascent of that singular peak so aptly described by Mr. Gilbert as a carious tooth of dolomite. The beck itself looked neither very high nor very difficult, but I afterwards learned that it was peculiarly steep and fissured, and that they had had hard work to conquer it. Gadina's glass proved to be a good one, and I distinctly saw the figures of the climbers and their guides standing together on the topmost peak, relieved against the sky. It being our intention to spend some little time at Cortina, thence making such excursions as lay within easy reach, we decided to devote this first day to getting ourselves acquainted with the general lay of the country. The most effectual way of achieving this end is, of course, to ascend some height, so, having consulted Gedina's written list of excursions, we agreed to spend the morning in rambling about the village, and after luncheon to stroll up to the Crepa de Belvedere, a little summer-house, or Jaeger lodge, lately erected at a point of view on the face of a cliff overlooking Cortina and the valley, about an hour and a half's easy walk from the village, and about twenty minutes to the left of the cross on the road to the Tresassi Pass. The Belvedere, a tiny white speck against a scar of red cliff in the midst of a long sweep of fir forest, is seen from the windows of the inn, and lies before the climber all the way. Meanwhile, however, we breakfasted, wrote letters, examined the paintings and frescoes in and about the two houses, and made arrangements for shifting our quarters into the quieter and better furnished rooms over the way. Two of the younger Gedinas, it seemed, were painters, a third carved cleverly in wood, and the fourth, a grave, practical man devoted to the business, the stabling, and the wood trade, played a trombone in the village band. Both houses are full of heads and studies in oil, designs for large pictures, and sketches of unequal merit. A head of a bearded man in one of the upper chambers of the Aquila Neri, and two half-lengths of his father and mother in the dining-room, may be taken as fair specimens of the skill of the portrait-painting son while the external frescoes of the dependents, two in the new church, and all sorts of rough-and-ready designs, some military, some religious, some grotesque, flung here and there upon the walls of staircases, cart-sheds, neighbors' house-fronts, and so forth, represent the superior gifts and culture of the brother who lives in Vienna. As for the decorations of the dependents, they are full of power, and to the sound drawing and skillful designing of the Munich school, add a warmth and tenderness of color almost Italian. Three large groups representing sculpture and architecture, painting and the physical sciences, and three medallions containing portraits of Raphael, Titian, and Albert Durer, cover all that is not window space above the ground floor. The figure of Mercury in the first group, and of Urania in the last, and the way in which such stubborn objects as the steam engine camera, and telegraphic apparatus seem to have been pictorially treated, are deserving of particular notice. To Albert Dürer, like a true German, the artist gives the middle place among the medallions. Very different, though almost as good in their way, are the mounted Cossacks, 
wild horses, and medieval men-at-arms that skirmished all over the whitewashed walls of the outhouses and stables of the Aquila Nera, to say nothing of the fantastic devil, all teeth and claws, that grins upon unsuspecting customers from outside the stove in the only chemist's shop in Cortina. We asked for the painter, but he was far away in Vienna, and his studio, they told us, was not only closed, but empty. End of section 7「Trodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys」Part 8 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Untrodden Peaks and Unfrequented Valleys A Midsummer Ramble Through the Dolomites by Amelia B. Edwards Part 8 Chapter 4 At Cortina Part 2 to ascend the campanile and get the near view over the village was obviously one of the first duties of a visitor so finding the door open and the old bell ringer inside we mounted laboriously to the top nearly a hundred feet higher than the leaning tower of pisa standing here upon the outer gallery above the level of the great bells we had the village and valley at our feet the panorama, though it included little which we had not seen already, was fine all around, and served to impress the main landmarks upon our memory. The Ampezzo Thal opened away to north and south, and the twin passes of the Tre Croce and the Tre Sassi intersected it to east and west. When we had fixed in our minds the fact that Landro and Brunec lay out to the north, and Perarolo to the south, that Oronzo was to be found somewhere on the other side of the Tre Croce, and that to arrive at Caprile it was necessary to go over the Tre Sassi, we had gained something in the way of definite topography. The Marmolata and Civita, as we knew by our maps, were on the side of Caprile, and the Marmarole on the side of Oronzo. The Pelmo, left behind yesterday, was peeping even now above the ridge of the Rochetta, in a group of fantastic rocks, so like the towers and bastions of a ruined castle that we took them at first sight for the remains of some medieval stronghold, marked the summit of the Tresasi to the west. "'But what mountain is that, far away to the south?' we asked, pointing in the direction of Perarolo. "'Which mountain, signora? That one yonder, like a cathedral front with two towers.' The old bell-ringer shaded his eyes with one trembling hand and peered down the valley. Eh, he said, it is some mountain on the Italian side. E una montagna della parte d'Italia. But what is it called? Eh, he repeated, with a puzzled look. Chilosa. I don't know that I ever noticed it before. Now it was a very singular mountain, one of the most singular and the most striking that we saw throughout the tour. It was exactly like the front of Notre Dame, with one slender aguille, like a flagstaff, shooting up from the top of one of its battlemented towers. It was conspicuous from most points on the left bank of the Boita, but the best view, as I soon after discovered, was from the rising ground behind Cortina, going up through the fields in the direction of the Bergantina torrent. From thence I made the accompanying sketch, and to this spot we returned again and again, fascinated as much perhaps by the mystery in which it was enveloped, as by the majestic outline of this unknown mountain, to which, for want of a better name, we give the name of Notre Dame. For the old bell-ringer was not alone in his ignorance. Ask whom we would, we invariably received the same vague reply. It was, a mountain della parte Italia. They knew no more, and some, like our friend of the Campanile, had evidently not noticed it before. What with the great heat of the afternoon, which made uphill work difficult and rapid walking impossible, what with the wonderful wild flowers that enticed us continually from the path, what with chatting to peasants by the way, stopping to study the landscape, sketching, and so forth, we never reached the chalet of the Belvedere after all. We came very near it, however, and gained a magnificent view over the valley, the Cristallo group, and the range of the Crota Malcora. Here also, from a grassy knoll near the cross below the Crespa, the writer devoted a long hour to making a careful drawing of the Antileo, which is here seen to its greatest advantage.
From no other point, indeed, is it possible, so far as I am aware, to get so good a view of the great snow slope at the back of the summit, in combination with the splintered buttresses that strike down towards Borco and Voda in the front. The first ascent of the highest peak of this mountain was achieved by that famous climber, Dr. Groman, in 1863, and the second in 1864 by Lord Francis Douglas of hapless memory, accompanied by Mr. F. L. Latham, and by two guides named Matteo Ossi and Santo Siorpas. The latter, a brave, hardy, faithful fellow, who travelled with us later in the autumn among the Italian Alps, and through the Zermatt district, assured me that Lord Francis, though so young, was an excellent mountaineer, and described him as buono, bello, e biondino, good, handsome, and fair. The ascent is taken from a pass called the Forcello Piccola, which divides the mass of the Marmarole from that of the Antileo, and is most quickly reached from San Vito. Owing to the long snow slope before mentioned, this mountain, up to a certain point, is considered to be easier than any other great dolomite except the Marmolata. But the last pull up the actual pinnacle, which rises with formidable steepness to a height of some three hundred feet, and curves over like a horn, is said to be difficult. It was supposed to be inaccessible till Dr. Groman's time, when the fortunate discovery of a certain cleft by one of his Cortina guides opened the way to the German cragsman and to all who should come after him. A good climber can ascend from and return to San Vito in eleven hours, exclusive of halts. The country folk were all coming up to their homes on the pasturages of Monte Averau, as we went down again in the cool of the early evening, some with empty milk-pails, having sold their milk in Cortina, others carrying home their store of bread and flour just purchased. One or two begged somewhat abjectly for a soldo por l'amor de Dio, but for the most part they passed with a brisk step, a pleasant smile, and a cheerful guten abend, or buena sera. A civil, kindly people on the whole, as we soon came to know right well a people ready with good wishes and little friendly salutations which, even if they have come to be spoken as mere matters of course, yet help to keep warm the spirit of good will. If they pass through the room where you are at meals, they will wish you good appetite. If you are going out, a pleasant walk. If you are on your way to bed, sound sleep and happy dreams. You yawn, and they wish you felicita. You sneeze, and they say salute. That evening, as we were sitting down to a meal which was dinner, or supper, or both, we were startled by a furious discord of drums and brass instruments in the street below. It was the company of strolling acrobats who had just arrived and were parading through the village, followed by all the boys and idlers in the place. A drummer on stilts, a buffoon in high collars and a tall hat, like Paul Pry, some half-dozen athletic fellows in the traditional fillets and flushings, and about as many hideous-looking, muscular women tramping the dusty road in white shoes and the briefest conceivable skirts. The theatre, it seemed, was open to-morrow, although the sagro would not be held until Sunday. It was on the morning of the third day after we had settled down at Cortina that the storm which had so long been gathering burst at last. Supported by the consciousness of his own merit, the courier had borne with us till he could bear with us no longer. Now, however, the near prospect of being dragged over passes and up mountains, of having to ride on a mule for days in succession, and of living for many weeks to come in Tyrolean albergo several degrees less comfortable than the Aquila Nera, was too much for the great man's philosophy. He understood, he said, that there were no carriage roads to most of the places laid down in our maps and no suitable accommodation, such as he was accustomed to when travelling with parties who placed confidence in his opinion. He therefore begged leave to tender his resignation and his accounts. Our vagabond tastes, in short, were too much for him, and he deserted us, if that could be called desertion, which must in all likelihood have taken the form of dismissal ere long, just at the time when the protection of a trustworthy and respectable man had become an indispensable condition of our journey. It is needless to add that the fortnight's notice which he offered was summarily rejected, and that he was then and there paid off and done with. 
As for L., by whom he had been retained for months before we joined forces in Naples, she transacted the whole affair with an amount of withering sang-froid that speedily reduced the offender to a condition of abject humility. He made an effort by and by to assert his indifference by playing at bowls in front of the albergo, but went away in the afternoon outside the Longarone schnell wagon, quite crestfallen. And now what was to be done? Could we possibly go on with only guides and no courier? Or must the tour through the wild heart of the country be given up, just as we had come within sight of our promised land? These were questions that must be solved before we could venture one day's journey beyond the post-roads of Cortina. As a matter of choice, we indefinitely preferred the absence of our discontented friend. It was so delicious, indeed, to be without him, that L. said she felt as if a necklace of millstones had been taken from round her neck. But then, as a matter of expediency, his defection was undeniably inconvenient. Could he, however, be in any way replaced? Not, of course, by another courier, that kind of article being quite unknown in these primitive valleys, but by some reliable man, as, for instance, Santo Siorpas, who had been specially recommended to us beforehand, and who was reputed to be the best head-guide in Cortina? To send for him and offer him an engagement for the whole journey was the first step to be taken. He came, a bright-eyed, black-haired mountaineer about forty, a mighty chamois hunter, an ex-soldier in the Austrian army, and now a custode of forests, and local inspector of roads, an active, eager fellow, brown as a berry, with honesty written in his face, and an open, vivacious manner that won our liking at first sight. Unfortunately, however, this jewel of a guide was pledged for the next six or eight weeks, and could not by any means get free. Had he no friend, we asked, whom he could recommend to take his place? He pondered the question and looked doubtful. There was old Lassadelli, he said, but he was too old, and there was young Lassadelli, but he was too young. Also there was a certain Angelo, but he was away, and would not be back for a month. Then again most of the men about Cortina were good enough at rough climbing, but not used to travelling with ladies. Well, he would think it over, he would think it over, and let the signoras know. But when would he let us know? This evening? He shook his head. This evening he was engaged to start for some distant valley with a party of gentlemen who were to ascend a mountain to-morrow. No, he could not promise to see us again before Sunday, but he would then wait upon us after high mass. This was all we could obtain from him. It was not much, and we began to have dismal forebodings of the failure of our plans. Meanwhile, however, it was of no use to despond. There was plenty to be done at Cortina, whatever happened. We could go to Pieve de Cadore, to Aranzo, to Landro, by good carriage roads. We could see about the side saddles. We could even go in what our landlord called a carreta, as far as Falzarego, the hospice on the summit of the Tresassi Pass, and thence obtain a view of the Marmolata. During the present uncertainty, it was some comfort, first of all, to agitate this question of the side saddles. In the event of our being able to carry out the journey, they were of more real importance than a whole army of couriers. Without them, certainly, we could do nothing in the way of peaks or passes. Now we knew, from previous information, that Madame Pezzi, landlady of the inn at Capriole, had a saddle which was, in fact, brought out from England and presented to her for her own use by F.F.T. A persuasive note couched in the writer's best Italian was therefore sent over by a special messenger, who had instructions to bring the precious object back, if possible, upon his shoulders. Then old Gadina also possessed one, but divining perhaps that we should be overlong borrowers, he was particularly reluctant to show it. It was not till the rider succeeded in following him one day into the stable that this mysterious treasure was allowed to see the light. It proved to be a fairly good saddle, but then it was only one, and even if we obtained Madame Pezzi's, we should still require a third. "'I am expecting a new Sella di Donna from Vienna,' sputtered the old landlord, in his polygot patois. "'Ein, schoner saddle.' "'When will it arrive?' I asked eagerly. "'Diavolo, I don't know. Perhaps to-night, perhaps next week. I have been expecting it every day for the last three months.' I relapsed into hopelessness. The old man grinned from ear to ear. 
He had a large, brown, flat face that looked as if it had been sat upon, and patted me on the shoulder with a paw like a Bengal tiger's. "'Tut, tut,' he said. "'You are a brava signora. You shall not be disappointed. We'll dress up a busta for the Camari era, and all shall be well.' This promise of the basta was obscure but comforting. I had not the slightest idea of what a basta was, and Gadina could only tell me what it was not. It was not a side-saddle. It was not a chair. It was not a railed seat with a foot-rest like a child's donkey-saddle. It had to be made when required, and should be forthcoming when wanted. Beyond this point we could not get, and there the matter had to rest, at all events, for the present. End of section 8